Hi everyone, uh, I'm Peter V. Brett, author of the Demon Cycle series. Uh, if you're watching from the UK, uh, we're published by Harper Voyager. Uh, you might recognize um, some of the book covers, so I'll just show them to you and I'll tell you a little bit about myself before we get started. Uh, and then I have some questions that people have posted uh, to begin with, and then uh, I will take any questions that people are posting on the chat on the um, Campus Society page. Uh, I'm a little new to streaming, so please uh, be understanding as I fumble around. Um, so, uh, the first book is The uh, Painted Man. Sorry, this time of day here is... Uh, right when the sun is in my window. Uh, first book is The Painted Man. Let me see if I can... It's a little bit better. Um, second book is The Desert Spear. Third one is The Daylight War. Fourth book is The Skull Throne. And fifth book is The Core. Fifth and final book, uh, which means that uh, unlike many famous fantasy authors, uh, this is a completed series. So if you're just starting out right now and haven't read my books before, you can binge the entire set. Um, there are also a series of companion novellas, uh, which I feel like enhance the story a little bit. Uh, and flesh out some of the uh, side stories that aren't really uh, able to work into the, the full-size novels. Uh, so we have uh, The Great Bazaar and Brian's Gold and Messenger's Legacy, and there will be one more coming out at the end of this year. It's called Baron. Uh, that should be publishing in September. Um, so as I said, this is a complete series. You can uh, binge the whole thing, uh, beginning, middle, to end. It's... Uh, probably about 4,000 4, pages or so uh, in total, so that's a good long read, uh, and no waiting. Uh, so you're better off if you start now than if you had to wait two years in between each book as I went along. Um, the series is published in 25 languages worldwide uh, and has sold uh, getting close to 3 million copies worldwide. Uh, it's a New York Times best-selling series. It's a London Times best-selling series. Uh, the last book, The uh, Core, is currently sitting on the German bestseller list. Um, next week, I'll be doing a book tour in Germany. Uh, next month, I'll be doing a book tour in Poland. Uh, so the books have uh, done well all over the world, and I'm incredibly fortunate to have this be my career. Um, so uh, a lot of the questions that I saw in the beginning were about how I got into writing. So I'm going to uh, talk about that a little bit first so that people have time to log on and post their own questions. Um, and I'll be following along a little bit. Uh, don't mind, I'm juggling multiple windows here. But yes, Clara Eastwood, over 4,000 pages in total. Um, and so... Uh, let me just adjust the light one more time. Please forgive me. Let's just go for full glare rather than half shadow. Um, so uh, I pretty much always wanted to be a writer. Uh, I started out... Uh, when I was in third grade in library class. You uh, may not know what a library is. Uh, some of you people in college now may have never seen one. Uh, there are these big rooms full of books, and we used to have them at school. Um, we took a library class, and we were learning about poetry in third grade. And I wrote a poem, and the teacher refused to believe that I had written it myself. She said that... Um, I must have copied it out of a book, and she wanted to know what book it was. And when I insisted that I uh, had written it myself, I got sent to the principal's office, 
and they called my parents and it was a whole thing. Uh, and the truth is that, that, uh, even though I sort of got in trouble over it, I was kind of stoked because I was really proud that I had made the teacher think that I had copied something. Um, and so ever since then, I wanted to be a writer. And uh, I wrote a book in high school, a terrible, terrible book, but a book. Um, it was maybe 200 pages, and it was a combination science fiction, fantasy, space adventure, uh, where like a metalhead and a jock have to be friends. So it was like the, the Breakfast Club in space with magic. Um, but I wrote it when I was 17. And finishing a book is a high that is hard to describe. And once you've done it once, you will find yourself chasing it for the rest of your life. Um, and so uh, I wrote another three books. Uh, I kept writing in college and um, wrote another book in college and then uh, graduated with a degree in 18th century literature and art history, which made me a uh, suitable for no job really at all. Um, so I went to New York City and I just tried to find any publishing job I could find. Um, so I ended up editing business to business directories, which uh, is a fancy way of saying that I used to edit phone books. Um, again, you may not know what a phone book is. Uh, back before cell phones, when everyone had a landline, there was a big book that had everybody's phone number in it. Um, it's probably the most boring thing anyone could ever edit. Uh, so I did that for a year and then I found a job editing, uh, medical journals. And so I, uh, was an assistant editor, uh, for John, um, John Wiley and Sons doing medical journals. Uh, and then I, uh, found another job for, uh, McLean Hunter, uh, editing medical newsletters. And, uh, from there I went into print production and then I joined a, um, a PR firm, Edelman PR, which is uh, the largest privately owned PR company in the world. And I worked there as their head of print production. But all along that time, I was writing novels. Um, by that point, I had written about four full novels. Um, and I, f I hadn't attempted to sell any of them because I didn't think they were good enough to sell. I, I was uh, um, convinced that my own work was not good enough. And so I didn't even bother trying to sell it. And then um, a friend of mine, author Mike Cole, took me to a Science Fiction Writers of America party where there was an agent, uh, a literary agent, and he told me to go over and talk to him. And I was like, oh no, I'm not ready for that. And Mike literally physically shoved me in front of this man and I had to start talking. So I told him about my books and I told him what I was doing. And, and I said, I haven't attempted to sell it because I don't think it's good enough. And he looked me in the eye and he said, you don't refuse books. I refuse books. So you send it to me and I'll tell you if it's good enough to print. So I sent it to him and he refused it. <laughs> um, sent me a rejection letter that I've uh, posted fairly recently to my Instagram feed if you want to read it. Um, in retrospect, pretty harsh. But to me, I, I think it was a good kick in the pants to remind me that like I'm moving into a professional world and if I want to be able to compete there I need to write at a professional level and so um, he asked me if I had anything else to show him so I showed him one of my older books which are even worse and he rejected that too but he took me out for a cup of coffee and told me what was wrong with them told me that he thought that I had what it took to get to a professional level gave me a book about writing which is called writing to sell by Scott Meredith um, and uh, asked me to rewrite the first book that I'd sent him. And that book ended up being The Painted Man, which uh, has gone on to sell close to a million copies worldwide and, and is responsible for the career I have now. Um, so uh, I did that rewriting on the train on my way to my day job. So I was commuting from Brooklyn to uh, Times Square in New York City, and uh, it was about a 45 minute to an hour train ride every day, both ways. And so I took, um, I had a, like a HP uh, iPack smartphone. It was like a Windows phone. This was back in probably 2005. So it was before the iPhone really took off. It had a very pared down version of Microsoft Word and I would open up one chapter at a time 
and sit on the subway and just type with my thumbs on the way to work and on the way home. Um, and I wrote about 400 words on the way there and 400 words on the way back. And then I would sync that to my computer and correct all the errors from typing with my thumbs and write another 200 words or so so that I would have a thousand words each day. And I did that five days a week for a year um, to rewrite the book. And that ended up being uh, the one that finally sold. Um, so it, it, it took a certain level of commitment of time and effort and uh, an ability to accept some really harsh criticism in order to, to level up. But I turned that book in thinking it was going to be another rejection. And instead, the agent called me up and said, this is the best book I've read this year, and I can't wait to publish it. And uh, so he took it to market and told me not to get too excited because he hadn't sold it yet. And we didn't know what was going to happen. But within uh, about three months of that, I had enough uh, sales um, in the US and in other countries that I was making almost as much from writing as I was from my day job. And I decided that I would take a leap and try and write full time. And so I, I looked at the contracts and saw how much money I had and saw that I could sort of stay afloat for two years. And, uh, you know, two years as long as I kept turning in manuscripts. Um, and I figured I'd give it two years and, and said, you know, I don't really like my day job now and I can always get another job that I don't like. And so I, I know that my bills are paid for now so I can do this responsibly. And so I stopped, I quit my job and uh, started writing full time. And that was 10 years ago and it's, it's worked out ever since. So I realized that I'm incredibly fortunate in that regard and um, I don't take it for granted. And I look at every new book as you know, this, this could be the end of my career if I don't do a good job. And so I try and do the best I can with each one. Um, and I'm very proud of what I've done so far. Uh, and it seems like it's been working out. Um, I'm sitting here with uh, Olagai Ka. Olagai Ka is the um, Lord of Demons, uh, the Father of Demons. He's on the cover of the latest book, uh, The Core. And... What we did was we hired a uh, Millennium FX, which is a special effects company, to make this statue. And um, then we did a photo shoot with him. And we hired a male model who put on a demon suit with big claws. And he sort of like hunched around and macked for the camera. And then we spliced the two together to make this incredible, uh, the lighting here is not great, but this cover is really sort of amazing. Um, so amazing that it was too scary for some markets in the U.S., uh, particularly in the Bible Belt. So the U.S. cover is different. Um, as you can see here, uh, we have a, uh, no, this way, this beautiful uh, cover with this woman drawing a mind demon ward uh, to protect herself. But we wanted to include both covers. So... If you have the UK one, you can move the cover off and see this picture. And if you have the US one, the demon is underneath, um, which I'm super stoked about. Uh, it just meant that I got to have two amazing covers instead of one. Um, so that's a bit about me. Uh, it looks like we've got a few more people uh, jumped in. So I'm going to go to the list of questions and start answering things. You can keep asking questions. I'm happy to uh, stay on for a while if there's enough questions to address. Uh, just minimize this window so I can still see. Okay, so... Um, David Black asks, uh, how difficult was it to format and or edit your book on that chunky old computer phone? Did you do most of it at a later date or did you regularly edit throughout the writing process? Um, so as I said, I did it every day. Um, it was part of my writing routine was uh, syncing the, what I had written back to my main computer, fixing the errors, uh, and eventually pasting each chapter as I finished it into what would end up being the final manuscript. Uh, I'm a big believer in editing as you go. I think that um, if you wait to the end to edit, uh, 
there are some advantages to being able to look at the whole picture, but you also can paint yourself into a corner early on and then have to backtrack and dig yourself out. Whereas if you edit as you go, you are less likely to be in that situation. So um, my writing routine, which I think came out of working in that sort of weird circumstance, is generally that uh, each day when I sit down to write, I look at what I wrote the day before. The first thing I do is reread what I wrote the day before. I make, um, I correct any typos or anything that I see, but I'm mostly looking to refresh myself and get back in the headspace of whichever character I was working on, but also to sort of look at it with a fresh set of eyes and say like, oh wow, that was a terrible metaphor, or oh, like I use this phrase all the time and I need to get out of the habit of doing that, or sometimes a day later I'll see like, that something I've written is going to end up um, painting me into a corner that I don't want to be in or, or cause some other or, or have a continuity problem with something else. And so I think that, that taking that time as I go means that when I get to the end and I do a reread of the entire manuscript and edit that, I've already corrected a lot of the minor problems and the, the manuscript is generally pretty clean and I can focus more on big picture questions like is there a plot hole here? Do I need it at do I need to add a chapter or like like does some does the character motivation make sense? Um, uh, do I want to change this character's voice to, to match the way they normally talk? Uh, so when you can focus on big picture things like that, I think it's easier. Uh, so I edit all the way through. Um, Katie the Scout asks, what inspired you to write your books? Was it something around you or an event that happened? Uh, where could I get them from? Are they all linked by the same story? Um, so all of my books are linked by these all. I consider the entire demon cycle to be one big story. Um, it starts off uh, with a certain group of characters. It, it adds characters as it goes, but every character gets closure in that last uh, book. And I already knew how it was going to end when I started. And so I sort of built towards that end the whole time. Um, so I think you're much better off reading it all as one, one big story now when you can binge it. Um, the people that stuck with me year to year as I went along, I really appreciate you being there for me. And, and the series probably would have gotten canceled if you hadn't been there, but I definitely feel like uh, the people reading now uh, have a big advantage. Uh, I'll just note, because it's kind of funny, that when I said the series, uh, my iPad thought I said, hey Siri, and is now typing everything I'm saying, um, <laughs> which is not creepy at all. Um, so uh, as for what inspired me to write my books, uh, I think that there's no one thing. Uh, when you're a writer, you tend to be the sort of person who makes note of interesting things as you encounter them and sort of keeps a mental log of them. And then some of them work into a book and some of them don't. Um, I was taking a writing class in 1999, uh, science fiction writing class at New York University. Uh, it was just a, something I was doing after work because I was interested in being a writer. And they gave us a homework assignment to uh, write the first chapter of a fantasy story. It had to be something new. And so I wrote this little short story. I stayed up, you know, I waited to the night before it was due and stayed up all night with coffee and cigarettes and uh, wrote this little story about a boy named Arlen who had never been more than half a day's walk from home because he had to be home at night behind the wards of protection before the demons came out because the demons came out at night. And uh, it was more of this sort of atmospheric story of this person with wanderlust who felt trapped at home. Um, but I was always wondering what was over that next hill, what, what was in the wider world after it had been sort of destroyed by demons and knocked back to a, a little house on the prairie level of technology. And for years, even as I was working on other projects, that stayed at the back of my head, and that was what became The Painted Man. Um, that little vignette ended up growing into this massive 4,000 plus word, or 4,000 plus page series. Um, 
But there were so many other things that inspired me along the way, things that I read, things that I'd experienced. Um, a lot of the sense of fear that, that permeates the books came from being in New York on September 11th and being terrified and sort of having an out-of-body experience where I was watching everyone around me and like seeing how everyone was scared, but everyone was behaving differently. And that, I think, had a lot of effect, on, especially on that first book, about the sort of fear that permeates everyone's lives. Um, but you can find inspiration anywhere. I don't think that there's a secret to it. And uh, if you're looking for a secret, you're looking in the wrong place. Um, so let's see. Uh, Charlotte Stevenson. Uh, what do you think fantasy offers as a genre that makes it particularly exciting to write and relevant to a wide variety of reading readers? Uh, would you say that well-written fantasy can change the world? And if so, is this something you aim to do throughout your own writing? Um, I am not so uh, egotistical as to think that uh, my fantasy books can change the world, and that's something that I'm aiming to do. Um, I think that most fantasy writers are primarily writing for entertainment, and that's what I do. Um, I do certainly have opinions about the world and about how people treat each other and about a wide variety of things. And through the characters in my books, I certainly express those things. And sometimes uh, I hope that a reader will get to see a perspective that they hadn't considered when reading my books. Um, I have a wide variety of characters, um, all of whom have conflicting beliefs. I have atheists and I have uh, religious zealots, and I have people who aren't sure about religion. I have men, I have women, and I have people of all ages and uh, different backgrounds uh, and uh, cultures. And in so doing, and having them come into conflict with each other and having them have to resolve those problems, I am able to show a wide variety of, of points of view. And I think that that um, is something that's really important and something that, that books need. And I think that, you know, occasionally somebody tells me that something that I read did change their perspective. And I'm really honored and proud when that happens. And I think that if you change one person's life, then that's a hugely uh, significant thing. Um, I don't know if that will necessarily have a ripple effect to changing the world, but uh, it's nice to think that it might. Um, I think that fantasy does have a lot of advantages because it allows us to talk about things in real life without pointing a finger at a particular person or a particular belief system and saying, you're the problem. Um, but instead allows us to talk about things a little more with a little more distance. Um, and hopefully that means that people who might otherwise be offended, uh, would take a minute and, and consider both sides of a situation. Um, so I do think fantasy has a real advantage in that, and it's something that I've always enjoyed about the genre, and uh, one of the reasons why I gravitate to it. Um, the other is I just think it's exciting. I, I like monsters, and I like magic, and I like um, a sense of wonder in my books, and uh, in the books I read, I mean, and so that's something that's always uh, been important to me. Um, so... Uh, Ax, A-K-S, uh, says, uh, Hi, Peter, what are your thoughts on dystopian fiction? Do you feel that it accurately portrays the world we live in today? Um, I don't feel that it accurately portrays the world that we live in today. I don't think that we live in anything close to a dystopia. I mean, I know that if you read the news and look at modern day politics in the UK or in the US or anywhere, like it can feel like we're in a dystopia sometimes. But the reality is that that there is less poverty uh, and less suffering in the world now than any other time in history. Um, and so I, I don't think that we're living in a dystopia, but I do think that there's a real fear that a dystopia is right around the corner. And I think that that's a legitimate fear and it's something that I feel all the time, especially uh, considering recent elections on both sides of the pond. Um, and so I think that that, the reason dystopian fiction works and the reason that it resonates with so many people is that we, we really feel like, you know, there are some of us who are living in, in horrible conditions already and, and are feeling 
really struggling or, or feeling like the world isn't there for them and, and society isn't built to support them. And then there are other people who are feeling safe and well-fed at the moment, but with a sense that it could all be taken away in an instant because of a natural disaster or because of you know a bad political decision or because you're in the wrong place at the wrong time or just anything. And so I think that we have this constant fear that the world could turn into a dystopia at any minute and everybody reacts to that fear differently. Um, some people uh, work really hard to try and uh, uh, raise the standard of living for people and help other people and, and work towards equality and work towards making the world a better place. And other people collect guns and wait for the, you know, wait for the end times and are ready to, to fight on the streets when they come. And, and it's, that's the sort of thing that I do like to talk about in my books is, is to have the, the, these different perspectives and show that like, we're all scared. We're all scared that something is going to happen to us or to our loved ones or to the world or the things that we care about. And everybody reacts to that differently. And I think it's really important to remember that, that even the people that uh, have incredibly different points of view from us and do things that we think are, are horrible are often doing it because they're scared. Um, and when you realize that, it makes it a little easier to, to understand their point of view. And I think that that's the only way to, to create a rapport and have a real conversation is to, to understand that not everyone who disagrees with you is coming it is doing it because they're corrupt or evil. They're, sometimes they're just doing it because they don't know what to do and they're trying to protect themselves and their loved ones. Um, let's see. Uh, James Goodwin says, uh, hi, Peter, what drew you to fantasy as a genre? Did you grow up reading fantasy or was it the genre that you believed would have the most fun with? Do you have any advice for prospective fantasy writers? Um, so uh, the first book that I ever read that, didn't, that wasn't assigned to me by school and didn't have any pictures was The Hobbit. Um, I think that that certainly affected the course of the rest of my life. I always wonder what it would have been if I had read Sherlock Holmes first or Tarzan or, you know, anything else. Um, but it was The Hobbit, and I loved that book so much that from then on, like, like that was the only kind of book I wanted to read. Um, but then I tried to read The Lord of the Rings, and at this point in my life, I was, you know, still uh, pretty young. And while The Hobbit was accessible to me, The Lord of the Rings was a little too dense, and so I couldn't get through it. And I started reading comic books instead. And so for years I read comics. I have a collection of thousands of comic books. Um, I would say that when I was 10 or 12 years old, uh, I had more friends inside of a comic book than outside. Um, and then my parents at first were happy that I was reading anything at all and then were frustrated that all I was reading was comic books. And so my dad went into the fantasy section of the library because he knew that I liked The Hobbit. And he literally just picked the first book that he thought looked good um, and brought it home and tossed it at me and said, read this. And that book was The Wish Song of Shannara by Terry Brooks, um, which was the third book in his Shannara series. Um, and I read that book and I loved it so much that I went back and read the rest of the Shannara books. And then I read um, the Dragonlance books and the Forgotten Realms books and um, went back and read The Lord of the Rings once I was a little older and able to handle it. And over time, I read hundreds of fantasy novels. I read, you know, some science fiction and some historical fiction and other things too, but fantasy was my real passion and it always has been. Um, and so now I, I had read hundreds of books before I tried to write one of my own and wrote a few of my own before I got to a point where I thought I was doing it on a professional level. Um, so that's why I, that's why I chose that as a genre. Um, as for advice for prospective fantasy writers, uh, read a lot, read as much as you possibly can. Uh, it doesn't always have to be fantasy books. It can be anything. I, but I think the more you read, the better your writing is going to be. Um, and write. I, I know that people are always thinking that there's some sort of secret or some sort of trick or some sort of shortcut that will get you to where you need to be. But I think that I am living proof that the only way to get to your good writing is to get through your bad writing. 
and I had a lot of bad writing. I, I went back and reread some of my older books just last week. Um, I was cleaning out the hard drive and I found some of my older work and I started reading through it. And while there are good things in it that I'm proud of and, and uh, uh, think were, were worthwhile, there's also a lot of really bad writing. Um, and now that I've had a chance to, to uh, grow, I look back at it and I, and I see those problems and I see why those books got rejected. Um, and so you kind of have to force yourself uh, to write even when it's hard, even when you don't have any ideas or even when you have ideas but you're convinced that you have writer's block and can't get them down on paper. Um, what I've learned is that if you sit down and you force yourself to write, the quality of your writing when you're feeling like you have writer's block and are uninspired and the quality of your writing when you are inspired and excited to write isn't really that different once you've developed the skill. Um, and what I also learned from writing on the train every morning, uh, look, getting on a New York City subway, a crowded New York City subway, and thumb writing on your phone on a screen that's, you know, maybe this big, maybe that big, um, I could see maybe 50 words at a time. And uh, I didn't always know what I was going to write, and I didn't always know, uh, uh, you know, what came next. But I only had that time, and so I had to write during that time. And I found out that over time, you can train yourself to be creative on command. And when I was in the zone doing that, if I was in line at the bank and had an extra 10 minutes, I could pull out my phone and I could write 50 words or 100 words. Um, if I was waiting for a friend to meet me somewhere, I could pull out my phone and I could write until they got there. Um, you can train yourself to be creative on command. It Absolutely. And I think that when you start telling yourself, oh, I can't do it because I don't have my special drink or I can't do it because I'm not in my special writing place or oh, I can't do it because I don't have my music or I don't have my headphones or I don't have this or I don't have that. It's just an excuse to procrastinate. It's an excuse to not do your work and you need to do your work. So if you want to be a writer, the only path to that is to write every day. Um, some days you'll get a lot of writing done and some days you'll only get a little bit done. But like if you solve one problem in your book or if you write a hundred words, you've done something and you've kept yourself in that headspace. And as long as you stay in that headspace, your brain will subconsciously be working away at problems even when you're not paying attention. And sometimes you'll find the solutions just come to you the next time you sit down to have real writing time. Um, the only way to be a professional is to is to get over that hurdle. Um, Jessica S, uh, what advice would you give to amateur writers when their motivation to actually sit down and write is very low? I think I just covered that. Um, you have to just do it. Um, you have to stop making excuses. Uh, writing professionally is a very competitive field. There are a lot of people who want to be writers. There are a lot of people working on novels. There are not a lot of people who actually finish their novels, and there are even less people who can finish their novels and take constructive criticism and go back and fix what's wrong with it without getting so butthurt that they give up. And so it's really important to remember that and really important to uh, keep at it, even when it feels like you don't want to, because, you know, the competition is out there working. Um, uh, Jennifer Rose, hi Peter, what advice would you give to any student wanting to write a book, including me, any tips or trips to make it seem less daunting? Again, uh, I feel like that was the rant that I just went through. Uh, so it, it's, I think that all of you have the same question for the same reason, and I need to tell you there's no secret. There's no easy way through it. Um, you just have to do the work. But if you're willing to do the work, that will already put you ahead of the curve. Um, because there are so many people who are working on a book and never finish it. And they don't finish it because they convince themselves that they can't. They convince themselves that, that, that something is preventing them. They convince themselves that they're too busy and they don't have the time and they don't want to sacrifice time that they would be doing something else. Um, every day when I rode the subway, I would read a book. 
And I love that time. That was my private time before I went to work. And after I got off work, I had my private time on the subway reading my fantasy novels. Um, and when it was time to work on my own book, I had to give that up. And I didn't want to give that up. I liked my reading time on the subway. But you have to make a sacrifice of time in order to do some work. Even if it's just an hour a day or two hours a day or half an hour a day, you have to make that sacrifice. And if that means that you can't watch that TV show or if that means that you can't go out with your friends that night, that's what it means. And if you do those things, that's okay. You're allowed to watch TV. You're allowed to read books. You're allowed to go out with your friends. But do it with the knowledge that you chose to do that thing over your writing. And if you make a habit of that, then maybe writing's not that important to you. Um, but if it is, then you have to make that sacrifice of time. Um, Rose Pearson asked me what made me consider writing as a career. Um, I covered that at the beginning of the stream, so uh, I'm going to skip that one, but thank you, Rose, for your question. Um, and uh, Gloria R.A., have you ever experienced writer's block? And if so, how many times and how often? Um, always and never, really. Um, I will always try and find other things to do other than writing. Uh, because writing is hard work, and I don't like hard work. Who does, really? Um, every day when I sit down to write, I'll open up my uh, Word document, and I'll get ready, and then I'll be like, you know, I need a drink, and I'll go get a drink. And then suddenly I find myself cleaning the kitchen, and I'll, I'll have to pull myself away from that and go back and sit down, and I'll write for a couple minutes, and then I'll say, oh, you know, I, I should get something to eat, too. And, and keep finding excuses to not work. And eventually you have to just say, no, I, I need to do this. Um, and that's the equivalent of writer's block. We, we've created writer's block to be this sort of like um, romanticized thing that like, oh, I'm suffering and I, I you know, I need to drink my pain away and I, I can't focus and it's so hard and, and it's all just making excuses. Um, when you have writer's block, you sit down and write. And when you don't have writer's block, you sit down and write. And that's the only way forward. That's the only way that you can get anything done. And writing a novel is not something that you do in a month, no matter what NaNoWriMo tells you. It's not something that you do in one big spurt. It's a, it's a marathon. You have to put in a little bit every day until you get there. But when you if you write every day, even if it's not a lot, when you look back, you'll find that you've made a ton of progress. A thousand words a day, every day, is 365,000 words a year, which is two, three books. Um, even if you only do it five days a week, you know, even if you only, you only do 500 words a day, that adds up if you do it consistently. And so this is the hump that you need to get over, is writing consistently, writing regularly. And you can do it. Don't let someone tell you you can't do it. Everyone can make time, and everyone can sit down and do that if they're willing to, to put in that effort. Um, and sometimes your writing is going to suck, and sometimes it's going to feel good, and you have to keep going even when, it, when you feel like it sucks to get through that and, and to learn from your own mistakes. Everyone's brain works differently. Everybody writes differently, and so there's no way to tell someone how to write because it's different for everyone. And so the only way to get there is to feel your way through it. And the only way to feel your way through it is to sit down and write. Um, so maybe that's not what everyone wants to hear, but that's the truth of it. Um, okay, so those are the questions that I had from the beginning. I'm going to look on the um, stream and see uh, what else we have. Um, Okay. Um, does spending so much time in PR and editing help you editing your novels? Uh, that's from Clara Eastwood. Uh, and yes, absolutely. Um, my career, my publishing career prior to being a novelist was a massive help uh, in my writing career. Um, 
when I was in print production, I used to talk to printers every day. I knew what they could do. I knew what they couldn't do. I knew what was a big ask. I knew what was a small ask. I did art direction for newsletters. I did art direction for um, slides and, present, and posters and presentations and ad campaigns. And so uh, I knew how to talk to an artist. I knew how to uh, make promotional items. I knew how to build a website. I knew how to find the people who knew how to do those things if I didn't know how to do them personally. Um, and I knew how to copy edit and how to proofread and how to, you know, what made a good story and how to uh, keep the focus of that story on what was interesting. Um, and so when I moved to writing professionally, I ended up having an incredibly useful skill set um, that helped me massively in my career. Uh, I don't think I would be as successful as I am now without that set of skills. Um, but they're all things that you can learn, and they're all things that uh, are secondary to mastering your writing craft. Um, you'll find a lot of people who are still in the early stages of writing who are already worried about how do I get an agent, how do I get published, how do I submit to, a ma to an editor, how do I promote my work, how do I uh, you know, set up an Instagram feed or a Twitter feed or whatever that will help me sell my work without doing the crucial first step of having something worth selling. Um, I really think that that puts the cart before the horse. Um, until you have gotten to a place where your writing is good enough to sell, those other things are all not what you should be worrying about. And if you're focusing on those worries and not on the quality of your work, you're in a dangerous place because then you're going to feel like once you've set up a, a, uh, a system to sell your work and the work isn't done, you're going to hurry through it and it's not going to be your best quality. Um, I see a lot of writers uh, who try to sell a book and can't sell it because the um, editors reject it or the agents reject it. And so their first step after that is to self-publish it. And it's not to say that self-publishing is not a viable way to get your work out there. It's, 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 I know plenty of people who self-publish their books and are very successful at it, but those people have editors and have the ability to take criticism and say, oh, this book was rejected. Why was it rejected? Can I make it better? Can I make it good enough to get past that hurdle? And then it's your choice whether or not you want to self-publish it or not. When somebody rejects your work and you say, oh, well, I don't want to uh, take their rejection to heart and I don't want to think that I need to be better, I'm going to just self-publish it, that's how you self-publish something crappy and that can be a real problem. So if you choose to self-publish, you need to be twice as rigorous on yourself because no one is doing that for you. Um, it's not a shortcut and if you treat it as a shortcut, uh, it's most likely going to be a real problem for you. Um, Jen, uh, said someone posted, um, oh, Peter Possert asked, uh, how did you come up with all the names for your characters in the cities and in the demon cycle? Um, coffee break. Um, for the most part, um, the names of my characters were relatively easy because I wanted to sense that, uh, the world in the demon cycle was just like ours. Maybe it is ours, maybe it isn't. I don't like to say. I know the answer, but I, I don't want to um, ruin that for some people who believe it's one. Some people believe it's our world after the demons came back and destroyed it, and some people think it's another world that's similar to ours, and I'm careful not to say one way or the other. But what I wanted to do was show that after the demons burned the libraries, people became largely illiterate, um, and so a lot of the names of the characters are just regular names that have been spelled differently because, uh, people don't know how to spell anymore. Um, and, uh, if you've ever read anything in Middle English, uh, the Canterbury Tales, for instance, you'll see that the same word is spelled three different ways on the same page sometimes because spelling was not important to them. And so, uh, throughout my books, um, some of the names look strange and people will pronounce them in, in odd ways. But if you really think about it, probably 90% of them uh, are just regular names that have had the name, the spellings changed. Um, 
which I've always been sort of amused by. Um, naming your characters is something that uh, can be really difficult. I usually keep a running list of names that I haven't used yet so that when I have a new character that I need to, to come up with, I can go through that list and sort of um, see what I think fits, what sounds right for the character that I have in mind. Um, I also have a, a book of 100,001 baby names, and when I'm feeling stumped, I'll flip through it um, and look for something that, that jumps out at me. Um, it's important to name not just your main characters, but the characters in the background. Um, it helps breathe life into them. It helps show who's a recurring character and who's not. Um, a lot of times, even when I write a big battle scene or something, I'll, I'll sort of uh, gloss over it in the beginning. And then when I go back and, and edit that, I'll put in proper names for everyone. Um, so it's not just like, oh, we lost a lot of good people. It's like, oh, we lost George. We love George. Uh, and oh, poor Sally, you know, she'll never, she'll never achieve her dream of being a baker or whatever. Um, these sorts of things, I think, uh, really enhance a story. Um, so that's that. Uh, Aaron Yeager, a uh, bit of a weird question, but what is that thing in the background, the golem looking thing? Okay, uh, I covered that earlier. Um, this is the statue that we used to um, make the cover for the core. Uh, we did an amazing photo shoot. If you go on my Instagram page or on my Facebook page, we have uh, behind the scenes pictures from the photo shoot, which are sort of amazing. Uh, the artist was Larry Rostant. Um, he's done all of my book covers, uh, the US covers and the UK covers. Um, and then he worked in conjunction with Millennium FX, who are an amazing special effects uh, house who um, took the art that we gave them uh, based on my own pictures and illustrations from my books and really brought to life this incredible uh, even let's see the light the light is super bright in here but maybe I can give you a better look this is my my buddy the, the father of all demons um, and they let me have him afterward and so we just hang out we're good friends he was in my daughter's nursery for a while um, she was uh, we put the crib in my office uh, when she was first born and so he stood over her crib every night and she loved him uh, she, uh, we have pictures of her reaching out and, and trying to touch his face and smiling and laughing because look, you know, when you're sleeping alone at night and you got this guy guarding you, no one's going to bother you. So I think he made her feel very safe. Um, I have a couple of other cool things in the background here too. Um, every once in a while we have fan art contests where we give out signed books. Sometimes we'll give out an early copy of a book that we haven't done yet. Um, and so I try and make it different every time. Uh, so one time we said make a diorama of your favorite scene from the books. And another time it was, uh, you know, draw the symbols of protection, which we call wards, on something in your house. Um, and one time I said, uh, take a doll or an action figure or some other toy and turn it into one of the characters from the books. And so this is uh, an example of somebody who won one of those contests. These are two of the main characters from the series. This is uh, Amon Jardir and this is Arlen Bales. Um, so these were actually Star Wars toys that... Um, she took and she painted over and just made these amazing action figures. Um, I have a bunch of other uh, similar things that fans have made over the years. Um, for instance, um, I had one fan show up to a signing uh, in London dressed as Renna Tanner, who's one of the characters from my books. She's on the US cover of Skull Throne and um, she has this magic knife that's been carved, uh, uh, etched with sim magical symbols. And so she made one and she gave it to me. Um, I just cannot express enough how incredibly fortunate I am to have so many amazing readers uh, who really 
have gotten into the series and, and, and live with me in this world that I've made up. And, and it's such a wonderful thing. And I, and I'm so happy about it and, and honored. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to get too, uh, I don't want to get all choked up on you. Um, people talking about the covers. Uh, there's a big debate about who likes which cover better, the UK or the US versions. Um, I think that they're both amazing. We have the same artist on both. Um, in particular, book three, The Daylight War. Um, we have the same character on the cover, on both covers, but the way that we set it up is very different and there's dramatic opinions over which is better, the US or the UK version. Um, I should probably do like an online poll one of these days. Uh, wait, this just jumped. Um, so, uh, Juwan uh, asks, how would you go about promoting fantasy to people of color? I would say there's a lack of fantasy-driven books directed towards people of ethnic backgrounds. Um, I would agree with you. There is a lack of fantasy books directed towards people that, of different ethnic backgrounds. I think that we're getting better. Um, certainly the genre uh, in its early days um, was much more focused as, as sort of like a, like a white and nerdy hobby. And so I think that a lot of the books reflect that. Um, and as the world is, is waking up to diversity and frankly, way too late, but it is happening. Um, I think that we're starting to see a lot more examples of fantasy books that are written by people of color that are, um, have casts that are more, uh, varied and diverse. Um, I've certainly tried to do it in my books. Um, I have two cultures that are drastically different from each other. And I try and give both of them the same sort of treatment where there are good people and bad people in both cultures. And they both have a, an overarching desire to, to save the world and do good. But there are also a lot of bad actors in both. Um, and I spent my second book, The Desert Spear, is, is almost entirely in that uh, other culture. The, the, I have a very Western culture and a very sort of Eastern culture. And the second book, I, for the first 150 pages, it's from the perspective of somebody who you sort of assumed was a villain um, because they were ethnically different from the hero and their ways were different. But when you're immersed in their culture, you see that he's just as much of a hero as the, the character from the first book. Um, and that was something that was really important to me and I thought would be a way to start showing that there's heroes in every culture and that there's uh, good people and bad people in every culture. And we have to give up a lot of our assumptions about that sort of thing. Um, but I know uh, a lot of authors now that are uh, coming in and I know the editors uh, at most of the major publishing houses are looking for people of color, uh, looking, writing fantasy stories and looking to publish those stories and looking to give a voice to a lot of people who haven't had a voice before. And I think that that's really important. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm worried that I'm going to lose my place, you know, in the industry or that other people, you know, other, uh, uh, people like me are going to lose their place. Uh, I think that the wonderful thing about books is that nobody reads just one book. Um, we start, we, we tend to think that like, Oh, if you're, if you're reading someone else's books, you're not reading my books and that means I'm losing. But the reality is that people who love books just keep reading books. And when they finish your books, they'll read somebody else's. And if you write more, they'll read yours. And so I'm happy to embrace uh, all sorts of new voices that are coming into the industry. And uh, I've read a lot of what's coming up and there's some amazing people out there. And so uh, this is something that we're getting better at. We still have a long way to go, but I, live in New York City. I know most of the editors at the major publishing houses. Um, I'm seeing more diversity in the editors themselves, and I'm seeing that they're looking for books from people of color, books for people uh, of different religions and different perspectives, and um, really focusing on that. And that's something that is good and something that we need. Um, Clara Eastwood uh, says, uh, 
I've heard uh, the best way to get good at writing is to write more, but were you part of any writing groups? Uh, no, I personally wasn't. I don't think that, that there's anything wrong with writing groups. I think that that's something that really works for some people. Um, for me personally, writing is a very private thing. I don't tend to show my writing to anyone until it's done. So I will work for a year or 18 months or sometimes two years on a book and no one reads it until it's done. And then I show it to a small group of beta readers who are very trusted people that I, I know well and I know won't just tell me what I want to hear. And I'll send it to my editor and my agent, who definitely won't tell me what I want to hear. And I uh, get that feedback then and make changes then. Um, writing groups frequently uh, will read it, you know, chapters as they write them or sections of their work as they write them and get critiques right there and then. And that's something that works for some people. Um, but for me, I, I feel like it's a private project for me. and I don't want that kind of input. Um, but I certainly don't think less of anyone who does it. I know plenty of great writers who have workshopped their books. Um, and it's sometimes frustrating that as you become a professional and you're writing to a deadline and you're, and you're uh, not able to sort of take your time about it, you don't get to have the, the same level of support from people that you did when you're an amateur and there was no rush to get your work done. Um, so even writers that I know that start out with writing groups have had to adapt to doing it on their own. And for some people, it's a real struggle. Um, some people still maintain writing groups after they've written 17 books, and other people have successfully made the transition uh, to doing it on their own. Um, and other people have their beta readers reading stuff as they go. Um, it's different for everyone. There's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, so you have to find out what works for you. Um, Aaron Yeager, uh, would you say writing is relatively easier than write, or writing fantasy is relatively easier than writing a thriller as there are no restrictions or rules to what can happen in a fantasy world? Uh, no, no. Uh, and I do think there are restrictions and rules to what can happen in the fantasy world. Um, to me, at least, it's very important that when you're writing fantasy, you have rules. You have rules for what magic can and can't do. You have rules for what monsters can and can't do. You have rules for any new element that you introduce to the story that's supernatural or, or not real world. Because, um, I mean, look, there's certainly, thrillers certainly have plenty of stuff that doesn't happen in the real world either. Um, I think that when you're writing a fantasy book, hold on one moment, when you're writing a fantasy book, you get a couple of because I said so's. So in my books, um, when the sun sets each day, demons rise out of the ground and attack everything that's alive. Um, why does that happen? Because I said so. You know, how do, how do they rise through the ground and then solidify on the surface? Magic. And I don't, I don't really have to explain it too much more than that. Um, and they can attack anything except things that have been painted with the symbols uh, that are keyed to the spe specific type of demon that's attacking. So if a rock demon is trying to break into your house and you've painted the rock demon ward on your door, he's not going to be able to, he or she, or it, demons or neuter, uh, is not going to be able to break through your door. Um, why does that work? Essentially because I said so. But after that initial because I said so, there's rules, and those rules uh, are things that I very strictly adhere to and rules that I explain to the reader as we go along. So as the heroes progress through the story and learn more and more about the world and learn more and more about the magic system, the reader learns more and more about the world and more and more about the magic system and specifically learns what magic can do and what magic can't do, what the limitations of magic are, so that when we get to the climax of the story, they don't feel like I just solved the project, like, like solved the big problem at the end of the book because I said so. It has to naturally follow from the rules that I gave throughout the story about what magic can and can't do so that there can't be something that comes in and just saves the day because magic. 
Um, I know a lot of books that do that, and I do not approve of those books. So um, I do think that you have to have rules. Um, and whether you're writing fantasy or writing a thriller, the thing that really drives the story is not your magic system. It's not your setting. It's your characters. And I don't think writing characters in a fantasy world is any easier or harder than writing characters in a Western or writing them in a mystery or writing them in a romance or writing them in any other type of fiction. Um, writing good characters is the hardest part of writing, I think, um, but it's also what makes it come alive and what makes it resonate with people. And so um, I think that if you have mastered that and mastered how to write, you can write in most any genre uh, without too much shifting of your skills. I mean, there's certainly there's a skill set to writing romance or a skill set to writing thrillers that's maybe a little different from writing fantasy or, or science fiction, but I think the core competency uh, is the same for all sorts of fiction. So I don't think it's any easier. Um, Matthias Schoen, uh, what's your advice on building worlds and strong character arcs? Um, you build the two of them together. Uh, the character arc is influenced by the world, and the world is influenced by where you want your character to go and what you want them to say and do. And so uh, you can't just focus on one. They sort of have to grow together. I had a boy, Arlen, with Wanderlust who couldn't leave his house because of the demons. And I had, you know, a magic system where there are demons and where there are these magic symbols. And that was my starting point. And the two of them grew together as the story went on. And as I introduced new characters and introduced new antagonists, um, those two things had to be built together. Um, I think that you need to have a lot of information uh, that doesn't make it into the story, but that you know. Um, some writers call this the, uh, the iceberg theory, where like what you can see is actually a small portion of the overall information. Uh, I have a book, uh, a, a word file really, called The Demon Cycle Appendix, which is mine and mine alone. I don't show it to anyone. Um, that's hundreds of pages of everything that I've ever made up about the series, and only a fraction of that has made it into the actual books, but if I need a story where I need to explain what the, you know, currency system in Fort Milne is, or if I need to explain some, like, complicated bit of, like, uh, culture in Krasia, I've already solved a lot of those problems, but I don't force the reader to read about it unless it's something that I can build into a story in a way that's compelling and interesting. Um, so I think that one of the big hurdles as a writer is when you come up with a cool, amazing idea and can't figure out how to put it into your story, learning to sit on it and wait rather than shoehorning it in in a way that feels um, extraneous and doesn't work. Um, having that patience, being able to wait for the right time to introduce a certain idea is one of the most important skills that you can develop. Um, So uh, another one from Peter Possert. Uh, what side character story did you enjoy writing the most? Oh, there's so many. I have um, dozens, if not hundreds, of side characters, and uh, it is both a blessing and a curse. Um, some of them were always meant to be important characters in the story, and some of them uh, just unexpectedly turned out to be. Um, so if, you're, if you've read my books, uh, some of the ones that are my favorites, personally, uh, Alicia Paper's mother, Ilona, steals every scene that she's in. Um, I, didn't, I didn't realize that she would be that compelling and powerful a character when I started, but uh, I have to use her very sparingly because whenever she walks into a room, everything becomes about her. And uh, that can be really powerful, but it can also derail a story if you do it, if you use it too much. Um, and then there are other characters who, uh, there was a big climactic fight at the end of the first book, and I didn't really know who was going to live and who was going to die when I first went into it. Um, and some of the characters who might have died in that story, I just decided I would keep around. Um, two of them, Garrett and Wanda, were, had sort of fulfilled their purpose in the first book, but they just happened to be in the right place at the right time throughout the rest of the series and became fan favorites and became favorites of mine uh, to the point where people ask about them, people cosplay as them, people do fan art of them. 
Um, and that's really uh, amazing and really fascinating for me. Um, so I love it. Um, we're getting towards the end. I have to put my daughter down for a nap. Um, so uh, if anyone has a last question, uh, well, I see one just popped up. Uh, I'll take questions for another five minutes and then uh, I've got to go. But this has been fantastic. Um, so uh, Christina Manns, uh, when you get an idea for a new story, do you prefer to create a detailed plan before writing or do you think it's better to just start writing and see how it goes? Um, so I preface this by saying it's different for everyone. Um, but for me, I plan everything. I write out a step sheet, which is basically just a bulleted list of everything that happens in a story from the beginning to the end before I even start writing the prose. Um, so I'll say like chapter one, this person's point of view, here's what happens, here's what happens, here's what happens, section break, you know, here's the, here's the important thing that, that ends the section breaks that leaves you wanting more. Uh, and then, you know, chapter two, we switch point of view to this person and they're having this problem and this happens and this happens and this happens. And I do that all the way through the entire book from beginning to end. So before I even start writing the prose, I know everything that happens. And then when I'm writing, I can focus on how do the characters feel about what's happening? What's going on through their head? What, what are they going through emotionally? How can I make the reader feel like they're experiencing what the characters are experiencing, but I've already solved most of the problems of what they're going through. Um, and I think that that's super important um, to solve those problems first so that you don't end up painting yourself into a corner. Because earlier in my career, I just sat down and started writing and made up the story as I went along. And amazing things happen that way. You sometimes can discover that, you know, oh, I, I didn't know how this was going to end, but then when it ended, it looked like I knew what I was doing all along because it sort of, the, the ending sort of naturally grew out of what I was creating. But there were also a few times where I had to cut out large portions of text because they didn't fit anymore, because I made a mistake somewhere and needed to go back and edit it. Um, and I learned that planning stuff in advance made it so I didn't have to do that. I think my writing is much stronger for planning in advance. Um, but then one of my good friends, uh, author Naomi Novik, she just sits down and makes up a book as she goes along and her books are amazing. So it's not for me to say which is the right way to do it. I think it's different for everyone, but I definitely am a big proponent of planning everything in advance and knowing what you're doing before you get in there. Um, so, uh, oh, and, uh, if you want to read a little bit more about that, if you go to my website, uh, www.petervbrett.com, um, there's a tab that says excisions, um, and it has some things that I've cut out of my books and I put in, um, notes about, you know, here's the scene, here's why I love it. Here's why I had to cut it out of the book, um, before you, even before you read it so that you can get a sense of like what it's like when you're editing to take something that you love and, and have to get rid of it to make the, the book better, because that's something that's really important and something that's hard to do. Um, so if you're interested, uh, if you haven't read my books, The Demon Cycle Series by Peter V. Brett, uh, check them out. Um, if you have read them or if you're interested in me, uh, you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook uh, at, at PVBRETT, PV Brett. Um, I've kept the same username everywhere to make it easy. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel um, where we post uh, interviews and, uh, fan art. And, uh, occasionally I'll stream myself playing a game or shaving someone's head, um, or getting my head shaved. So, uh, check it out. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Uh, this is only supposed to be relatively short. I think I've gone a little over, but hopefully you don't mind. Um, thanks so much. Have a good day.